Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Taco Bites, your daily bite of DGEN, episode number 165, 165 episodes the week. Uh, we're going to send out some quick invites, uh, and so as we do that, we're going to go on mute, and we're going to have some vibe. So we're going to do this, and we're going to do that right. We had to wait for the phone to charge a little bit. We apologize for some technicals on, on getting this out, um, but we will be there shortly. So, as we are back, we are hoping that everyone is having a great, wonderful start of their week, with it being Sunday, the 29th. Some amazing news sort of hit the waves uh, the last couple of days. You know, people are talking about what is blockchain doing and, uh, you know, what is uh, coming on? Um, it's one of those really weird things. Where, uh, um, man, some awesome things are coming up. Tezos is uh, joining the state of California in partnership with the DMV. How interesting is that? And great uh, spot tonight. You know, great person got to meet this week in Miami at Quantum Miami. Uh Sandra, how are you? Well, good evening. How are you? I'm still whirling over all the info from Quantum Miami. You were like a sponge like no other. I have not seen that for a moment, but I had my notebook out at times too, so you are not alone. Yeah, I um, decided that this conference was going to be like my classes, like a curriculum work. So I made sure I could get as much as I could out of it. So then now I'm at home doing a lot of my own research over everything. Nice. Nice. What was, what was one of the biggest things that you took away from uh, Quantum Miami? This is the one thing, the first time for me to see, because I've gone to Permissionless, NFT Con. Um, a few other conferences. I've been in real life. I've gone to some meetups and stuff like that. But the one factor that really was surprising was the ages. I mean, there was such a diverse age group and a lot of people 
over 30 that was really, really nice to see, even over 40 and 50. Yes. Um, uh, it was, it was, this wasn't your first uh, blockchain conference, was it? It was my first Quantum Miami one. Okay. And let me tell you, I was very impressed. Usually you have, what, a whole exhibit hall full of exhibitors, and then you may have three or four different stages all around. This one, you had a main stage, very organized. You did have the classroom hub, which was very good. And the exhibitors that were there had a lot of substance, and they had a message to say. Yes. Yeah, no, I... Um... It was it was good. I do. I I wish there was a, a, a little bit of a bigger exhibitor hall um, just because that's I, I love seeing what people are, pro, you know, building that way. But got to meet with so many different people. You know, it was on point. Um, I think the only thing that disappointed me is I really wanted to meet Paul Barron uh, and was not able to do that. I, I was surprised at who all just was there. I mean, Clive Mesador, I was like, oh, my God, I'm in the same room with this uh -huh. kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and you're not too far. Uh, you're not too far away from uh, Miami, though, right? No, I'm like uh, about an hour north. Um, I will send you the details. But there is a there's an event tomorrow night uh, at the Solana Embassy. If you're if it interests you at all, I will find it and I will send it to you. Um, well, if I can get off work, I will be yeah. there because I work Monday through Saturday night. You so. are a workaholic and you are driving. <laughs> uh, for those that are listening later on, what is it that you build? What is it that you're building? Well, I am really into education and I am a senior citizen. And my whole purpose is to have a project where other senior citizens and people of all ages really but I have an outreach to senior citizens, a place for them to feel safe. I'm building a community over on Geneva platform that has the Onboard 60 home, which is similar to Discord channels. Similar, but more friendly for people my age, I think. So, yeah. I've also got a Web3 study or home or channel over on Geneva also. I'm going live starting February 7th with um, Tuesday, Friday. They The way Geneva is, it's similar to Console, which is coming up too, to where you're able to do live chats up to 15 people. You can have a broadcast up to 5,000 people with so many people on stage. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, it was, um, it was, it was amazing. Um, I got to, um, I got to, to meet some of the other pillars of web three, um, that only, have, you know, been able to share space with, or been in their spaces, listening to them talk, um, you know, uh, being able to share the same room as, uh, I'm going to butcher his last name and I apologize, but, uh, Chuck Schumer. I think the, the director, the movie director, um, you know, and seeing what they're making with, uh, with Ken Vu and, uh, yes, that was like, wow, that blew my mind. Yeah, I, I got, so I got to meet him in the, in the green room and like, yeah, he, he's, he's on board. He's web three is, is coming through, you know? That was something else that I really uh, appreciated was the substance of the speakers and of the panels and the people that you were in conversation with out in the hallways. It was very on point, very direct, not a lot of flowery BS, not a lot of shiny objects. It was just to the point and direct. And I really appreciated that. Yeah, no, it was, I, it was, it was really good. It, um, uh, the size of it sort of reminded me of NFT Las Vegas, um, where it was sort of just like a little band um, of, of, of projects. Uh, so you got to sort of talk to everyone, you know, um, and, and learn so much. Um, 
I was really happy to finally meet the the Giddy t- or not meet, but I, it's been a few times I've met the Giddy team, but finally see their wallet up and running. Um, that was pretty. That was pretty cool. I have to say, I have to say, I am I am one of those senior citizens from 2016 getting in the space. I've got um, what is it an Avex wallet that I got years ago? It's got like 900 or something in there. That before I even knew what seed phrases was, mm-hmm. you know, to where there's no access to it so to the point of giddy um i was like you know i want to find something that i can put on my study or in real life resources that i can show as a very simple easy way to get somebody my age no problem so of course i did it and it was very very easy very accessible and i'm really looking forward to learning more about it nice did you end up getting uh did you end up getting downloaded with them? Oh yeah, I was while they were talking to somebody else, I was watching their commercial and I was like, "You know what? Let me try it. Just try it." And I went over to the side of their booth and I downloaded it within a minute. It was so easy. Yeah, distributed keys uh key phrases is it's one of those really cool tech tech pieces which um, you know, it, it, it decentralizes it a little bit and takes a little burden off the shoulders of like, where are you going to save these 12 words or 24 words, you know? Uh, but you know, one of the things that people seem to keep these days are phone numbers and emails. And so there's, there's gotta be a little trust in the system and something like this, where we use authentication and 2FA for everything, um, it, it makes it really easy to, uh, to to have faith in that and see that come out and how quickly it works. And what I appreciated more so, not only that, is a, a, most of the people that I talk to that are in the senior or how many, I'm going to just say this, of a particular age or not in the know, because there's a lot of people 30 to 50 that are not in the know. Uh, they say it's complicated when it comes to having to buy from Coinbase and move over to MetaMask and have to exchange and things like that. And being able to see how wallets are being streamlined over the next few months and how there's so many options out there. I'm really like that idea of having it being seamless and invisible. Yeah, no. And, and it's one of those things to where as UIs clean up, and you know the UX is more streamlined. It will make it easier for more people to onboard. You know, like the my my the running joke that I sort of made up in my head. You know, you, you thought the DMV was slow. Now, now just wait until you know you see how they implement Tezos, and they have to learn all of that. So it's going to be really cool to see and interesting to see one how they're implementing it. Are they going to be implementing it? For, trans, for information and database storage? Or are they going to be, is this the start of digital identities with California leading the charge? I do think that digital identity is, is coming quickly. I really do. Yeah, no. And, and it's almost something that's needed for the simple fact that uh, start now, um, you know, but let's, uh, done right. I don't know if you got to see uh, you know, Brock Pierce's uh, talk on, 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 on digital identities or not. And he talked real quick on it. So did, uh, yes, yes. I even, I wrote everything down that was on the screen. Yeah. Um, like it's, let me tell you, K O A T dot A I. Yep. I think that's his, one of his digital companies or something that he has something yep. to do with. Yeah. So that's one. That's one of my DYOR projects. His other one that, that he talked about was life. Uh, that was the di. That was yeah, life. Yep, that was that was the DID one, and then um, Libre Wallet, which yeah, yeah. I got yeah, Libre dot yep. org. Yeah. Oh yeah, you know, you said I was a sponge. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that and shout out for uh, to DeFi Alliance. I see you. It would love to help have have you jump up if you want. Uh, we're talking a, a little bit about Quantum Miami and sort of the things that sort of broke the news this week and, and getting ready for the next week. Um, 
No, so it was one of those things where, um, yeah, no, hats off to the entire uh, quantum uh, team. My my question, um, and I didn't realize this, I didn't connect it until the next day as I was leaving Miami, and someone had put up uh, a question of, do you know what the first, and I know this answer, do you know what the first NFT was? I have no clue. DeFi, do you know the answer without Googling it? Uh, I don't, actually. I thought it was something to do with um, uh, punks or something like along those lines, wasn't it? Uh, no, the first NFT... Was it Jack's signature? It was, it was uh, um, McCoy. I, I think his first name was um, even either Kevin or Kurt. The first NFT was called Quantum. And it was a video clip of his wife doing something. I, I don't remember what. But I remember it being his, a, a video clip of his wife. And it was called Quantum. Uh, and so because it was quantum used to be uh, Bitcoin um, Miami conference and now they changed their name. So I didn't know if they picked it didn't hit me until Saturday. I'm like, I wonder if they changed their name to quantum uh, because of that or, you know, for some other reason. But uh, yeah. Well, I do think that quantum Miami, that particular conference is a really solid one. And it's been going on for a while, and there's always some really, especially amazing alpha and some really good speakers yes. there. Yeah, um, really good. Uh, so I just did a quick. Uh, it, so they're going to be digitizing car title management system with Tezos. That is what the DMV is going to be doing. So on chain titles. You know what's so crazy is part of my project is talking to senior citizens about being able to look at NFTs as documentation. They're just documents. Yeah. So now I have a real case scenario within the country, it's our own country, yeah. to show them. Yeah, and that's uh, that's pretty amazing to you know, not only not not just a DID but ownership um, in a, in a state that usually that. We all have our own thoughts on California, whether they're good, bad, or slow, um, or just different. Um, that the they're gonna have it ironed out uh, within the next three months of how to roll it out. So that's pretty cool. I really want to watch this. Yeah, it's gonna be amazing. Yeah, so. That will be, be really cool. just with the amount, just with the amount of population, the volume that you have there. Yeah. Well, uh, and, and it wonders if they're going to do like a, a, a slow rollout, you know, make it an optional thing for a while before they, you know, for so they can test it out and, and scale it. Um, and just really also on board, you know, I'm, I'm wondering what they're going to be doing, how they're going to be showcasing to the people that are going to be using it. Yeah, like how are they going to get a digitized wallet? Yeah, you know. So, are they going to go through email like some other people are doing? You know. Yeah. And then another, another. See, now you've got me like thinking about this. Sorry. Um, another thing would be: Are they inquiring about using starting with just businesses first and working their way from business to the everyday person? Yeah, you know that kind of thing. Um, it, it's yeah, it's. I think well, what they're sort of saying is the the reason why, and it was signed with an executive uh, 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 order, was uh, mostly due to um, car titles that have any faulty issues. Uh, it's easy for the owners to go to different states and get titles that you know because those issues don't show up in other states. So you know, proof of history of a car um, will really make that that um, a thing of the past. So it will be cool because California, you know, usually leads things with a big stick. 
either you play by our rules with other states or you don't play with us at all. And, uh, you know, you know, next thing you know, who knows when you're crossing into California, instead of them just checking for fruit, they'll be like, do you have your, your NFT of your car title? (laughs) So that'll be, uh, fun to see. Um, but, uh, and also, it would be sort of fun to see if you move from California to another state like New York, how are they going to do that kind of transfer? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, since it's not legal to do in New York. <laughs> but I mean, it's exciting because I mean, it's gonna, it's sort of like, I know it's a totally different industry, but it's like the same thing with marijuana, how it started with some states and it moved over. Because other states said, okay, it's acceptable. Same thing with this kind of car title on the chain. Other states are going to be like, well, hey, you know, we're missing out on this revenue also. Yeah. So. And, and that will be that will be good for the Tezos network as well. Um, and really, I don't think it, I don't, at a, at a state level, I can't think of any chain being even queried um, other than, you know, I know if, like Colorado and a few other states like Florida, you know, accept uh, taxes paid in crypto um, state taxes. And so um, it will be really interesting to see. Yeah. I think the Miami city coin is coming up to main net real soon. Yep. So the, that's there's something. the Miami city coin. There's uh, the New York city coin. There's a couple of city coins. Um, I'm I'm part of that Discord group, so there's there's a couple of groups, a, a couple of cities in front of the Dow. I'll have to I'll have to check and see uh, if anything in California is coming up uh, that I might have to vote on. So, but I don't know. I I just I love things like this. This sort of well, like you know took took from a small distraction from you know quantum, but not that much. If anything, it just uh, shows the proof of it you know DeFi, i see your hand up so would they be would, would they, the coins would they count as like state level cbdc's so mo- mobile coin is it, what it do, is no it is a city coin ran by the people so what uh first has to happen for a city coin is it goes to the DAO, and if the DAO approves it, then people um, can start running validators um, and nodes. And once there's, I think if I remember right, the threshold is 100 validators um, and 100 nodes running, um, then it comes to the validators to, they're mining the tokens. Um, That's when, once they, once, so they have a, a block height, they then have to get to. Um, and so it's not actually ran by the city, but what happens is the transaction fees have, I think it's either like 70% or 50% of the transaction fees are set aside for the city to access. Last I heard, and and I'm sure it's gone up since the last time I heard, but like New York has like $7 million, uh, waiting for it when it wants to access its wallet. It's also a way for the citizens of this city, of the state, whatever, to be able to vote on what's needed, where the money goes at the same time, how things are going to be prospering within your city, how you can make that even work and how you have be a part of yeah there was talk at one time that the reason one of the reasons why new york uh was saying they wouldn't touch it and a few others was because they said that they didn't want to be told where the where the money to be directed would go um and i i find that sort of hilarious that if money's raised to fix the streets so to speak and uh that is what the people that brought the money into existence and used the money for um, the state wants to be able to say no to that. And especially since it would be on chain, it would be completely where anybody would see it. They really are afraid because then you have to hold yourself accountable. Yes. And 
the states always like to find loopholes to get out of stuff like that. Uh, and that's just a classic. I'm, you know, one of the things that everyone's like with Colorado and I, um, uh, I know Charlie Brown, he was the legislator that got Tabor back in. Oh my gosh. I don't remember if it was like early two thousands. So that was the tax, uh, uh, tax Authority Bill of Rights, if I remember right, Act. Basically, that if there was any um, any uh, tax raise, it had to go to a, uh, the vote of the people. Um, and it only could match inflation and no more than that. Um, and a lot of people blamed a lot of different... Um, earmarks for failing and like why social services, you know, because they would tie all of these bills together, you know, and that's one of those things that I've always very much disliked. Um, you know, I understand the purpose of it, like, you know, quid pro quo. So, you know, you vote for uh, city contracts for a dumping yard to get, get a new contract at the same time that you have to, you know, the same vote goes, you know, to approve uh, food expenses uh, for lunch menus for schools or something along those lines. And that's one of those, it's, it's, it's a classic Capitol Hill, um, you know, sometimes referred to as pork spending, but, or, or earmarked um, earmarks. But um, I, I've come to realize as much as I dislike it, it's one of those things that people have learned how, like they've have to do to get bills passed. Yes, Sam. Sam. Yeah, how did you know that was my nickname? Oh, I told you that was you my did. nickname. Family. Okay, I sure did. Um, well, the one thing that I think people don't understand is once you put those bills on the blockchain, once they are there, once things are decided, they are not going to be able to take control, and that's what they're afraid of. Yep. Yeah, no. And it's it's one of those things where, you know, one vote, one action. But uh, it is sort of but, uh, you know, everyone says that that will flood um, with votes. But I, I think that it actually brings more transparency. DeFi. Being from the UK, I'm looking at this as a different angle. That's why I'm asking as many questions as I can. Um and one of the things I'm thinking of is basically if, for example, Britain was to make its own, let, let's say each country was to make their own sort of blockchain. So you'd have um, US, uh, USA blockchain and British blockchain and all that sort of jazz. And we did everything on chain. Wouldn't it sort of, and using DAOs as well, wouldn't it actually make governmental stuff actually a bit safer in many regards and and sort of like stop people from being able to cheat the system almost because essentially everything's on chain and everybody has their own votes and and then we actually know where the money is going to be used and where it should be used and what it's actually being used for in a realistic world uh don't know everybody's views on that so yeah no it, it's almost almost like that in a way. Um, one of the things where, um, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, a city or a country's currency um, that's sort of held and delegated by the people. Um, mobile coin, um, I, I threw that up in, or city coin, um, I, I put that up in the bird's nest. Um you know, so you guys can find the right link and stuff like that to follow it. They're down to do whatever, you know, so like it, but it's one of those things where it even has to go in front of the Dow to onboard a new city in their view, because, um, you know, will it bring value, you know, because they want to, they want to know that, that, you know, instead of just onboarding every city they go to, or that could, could access it, they want to make sure that there's enough people involved that would create that value. 
yeah, the one con- the one concern is that you can have a lot of people be a part of the DAO, but you'll have the core people continually voting or influencing the DAO. And that's another concern. Yeah, to a point, you know, and, and but if anyone um you know um yeah. I mean that's I think from the politician side, you know, from the governmental yeah. side. They're they're cuz they want the control. And their fear is that if you do have multiple votes, they don't have enough people to do the influential vote. Yeah. And it's one of those things, too, though, that um, they there's enough delegation that that other cities can vote in it as well. So any coin holder can vote. Um, and you would think that there's enough um, group decision, I guess you would say that would be towards the benefit of all, you know, and it, because the, because the vote peer, votes on chain DeFi. But then wouldn't they need to sort of like program it in such a way, either using, let's say, for example, using NFTs, like I do with my one where we use super Dow and one NFT equals one vote. Uh, well, actually any, so you can have as many of the NFTs as you want, but you'll always get one vote. So wouldn't that be the easiest way of doing it? So rather than um, having so many people voting, wouldn't it be one vote programmable? So it's one vote equals one, or, or how many tokens you've got equals one vote. Well, doesn't? Yeah, I no, I see what you're saying there. Uh, you know, almost, you're you're thinking, are you, or well, let me clarify and just wanted to say, uh, I see you, Liz. Happy to have you up if you want. Um, are you saying like almost one coin, one vote, or are you saying one wallet address, one vote? One wallet address, one vote. So, well, so what would then happen is people would then spread their co- tokens between wallets. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, is if you would, if you make the coins a soul bound token or the NFTs a soul bound token, so they can't be transferred. Yeah. But then, so the idea behind it is that they're they're used for commerce. So I I see where you're sort of aiming for, you know, on the fact of, you know, like one wallet KYCing or something like that, and that's the that's the wallet that has a vote. Um, so so not KYC exactly. Correct. So yeah. It, so not KYC. So it would basically be a. Like they probably still could manage to flip the system if you don't do KYC. Mm. But the idea I'm thinking of is like, is if they made it a soul bound token so that it would, so they, they can buy it in one wallet and then couldn't transfer it over, which, which in some ways makes it slightly harder because they'd have to buy more later on. And if the price, let's say is, it is pl- uh, the fluctuation of price does happen with it if it goes up a lot it could stop people from buying more yeah it could it it could but then you're getting your your the idea behind it is participation and so um the more people that you have participating um it benefits now if you're making a vote now on a on a national level i could see that you know um one one wallet one vote versus you know but that comes to um an almost kyc of of qualifying someone to vote you know because but where where it sort of s- set out right now is that at least with city coin Um, and one of the things I forgot for some reason, I was thinking it was running, it's, uh, it's running off of Bitcoin. I, uh, I forgot it was, I thought it was running off of something else. Um, but, uh, it, uh, it allows people to have a voice that might, you know, not necessarily be there. Um, and so, (sighs) I see where you're going with this and I want to hear, I want to hear you play it out more please because I, I'm not, I'm not tied to it. I, I don't think it would be a, an optimal way. Um, Cause um, now once you have certain members in a DAO, um, 
yes, by NFT, but the thing with the soulbound token, a DAO is also, I also have the choice to no longer associate with, you know, quit. But if it's a soulbound token, I can't transfer that to someone else. You you can in a way because what the how they can program it is that um, they lock it to your wallet as long as you want to be a part of it, and then as soon as you because um, there's two ways you can do so soulbound tokens is one you can have a soulbound token that could be an identifier for your wallet that can't be transferred. Then there's a soul bound token, which is called a locked token. This is where the person that created the contract has the ability to be able to turn on and off the transfer of that particular um, NFT. So what you would then do is, is you would, you would have to speak to them first and say to them like, look, I want to step down. I no longer want to be a part of this um dow uh please may i transfer this nft either back to you to be resold or to be reused or can i transfer it to another family member or to another friend that wants to get involved on my behalf or or instead of me yeah and and i uh, i i see the purpose of that but then that also then um that defeats almost the purpose of of if if I can transfer it to someone else, but I have to have someone's permission, that sort of beats decentralization. You know, because then what you're saying is that I have to get in um, in a DAO, I have to get someone else's permission to leave the DAO or to transfer my vote to someone. I just don't think that that's that that meshes with now in a in a different structure i can see i can totally see where that wor- would work and i've used i call before soulbound tokens i would call those you know purpose either blacklisted tokens or uh, broken contracts to where um we would use those with proxy tokens as well when doing like um icos and stuff like that where they can um they can only be transferred to uh, white. They're whitelisted, basically, um, to one address and one address only, like you know the main contract. So someone come, uh, I distribute tokens to someone, uh, to you. You, if you tried to send them to Sam, uh, one there's you know a ninety nine percent slippage, um, and like ninety nine point nine percent tax and then um or just blacklist meaning you can't send it to any other wallet other than um to the wallet i designate and then you would sort of you know sell them back to me or buy it back to me or give it to me and then it would be my choice to give it to sam but that sort of takes away um you know in a voting process i can see like uh, at a federal level or state level where something or even country level that that would need to be done for the simple fact that like proof of identity that, you know, it's a val you're a valid person receiving versus or sending and that you're sending it either to another one of your wallets or to um, the wallet of someone else. But the idea almost behind Soulbound is that there's a single issuer and that issuer has control of it. And so that doesn't really fit, in my opinion, within a DAO structure, because then, um, you know, you could say uh, the central authority uh, of the DAO has the choice whether or not to recall, whitelist a transfer or even re, uh, reissue, recall and reissue. Um well, not necessarily, because what you could also program in is a, is the ability that once the NFT has been transferred, oh, let's put it this way then, right? So let's say they, they program it in that you can only send it back to the DAO, right? So, um, so then the DAO can redistribute it to somebody else. So you can leave that way. So that brings back some of the decentralization but then at the same time they also program it 
in such a way that once it's sent to you, only you can then send it back to them so they can't then recall at any time. Yeah, uh, oh, that, that would be like white, black, all wallets are blacklisted except for the main marketplace um, wallet is the only one whitelisted. Yeah, no, and, and I see that. I've seen that in a, in a couple things. Um, like, you know, as a proxy token for with like VCs and stuff like that, waiting for a contract to, you know, for a token to get audited. You know, they're given a certain amount of tokens and it, uh, and it can only go back to one to- one wallet. Um, so you could technically those would fall into the category of Soulbound, but Soulbound also is meant to be as an identifier. Um, and one of the, you know, um, you know, a one way that that's sort of like I've seen it done recently um, is with diamond NFTs uh, by I think it's I think it's called Diamond Protocol, you know, where um, only they can issue the NFT. You can trade it, but it's based off of once once it's issued and created by Diamond Protocol, it represents a true diamond. Um, and then I can trade it and do whatever I want with it. And but um, if I want the diamond itself, I can only, you know, I can send it, to, I can only send it to um, the uh, diamond protocol in exchange for the actual diamond. Now, if I give the diamond back and I want to make it liquid again as an NFT, I have to give them back the diamond. It has to go re go through its certification with them again to prove that it's, a, you know, that same diamond for a new NFT to be issued. Um it, it just within, you know, the easiest thing that 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 DAOs have been able to do is within token structures. Um, one, you know, one token, one vote. You know, a distribution model for the tokens for those that have participated or shown they want to participate. Um, but then a certain amount of token levels to be able to um, make a proposal, so to speak. Um, and that's for the simple fact is because NFTs are limited to, you know, a series. So one, you, if you make it an NFT on, you know, only in that series could be created. Um, but what happened if the community grows bigger than that? And that's where tokens can sort of play the role, you know, one full token equals one full vote. Um, and you know, you might not know, but you can easily delegate your token to someone else. Um, and once it's um, once it's been voted for, it it can be returned. And that's all been done within smart contracts already. With smart contracts already. Right, so that makes sense because um, I'm using something called SuperDAO. And in the next couple of uh, days to a week or so, we're going to have our own 10K NFT series, which will be attached to the DAO. And basically the idea is once you have brought one of those NFTs, you have voting rights within the DAO. Um, and, but what we're going to do is we're, we're, we're debating whether we make them transferable or not. Um, at this moment in time, we're thinking we are. Um, so uh, that's why I was wondering how they're working because it's just an interesting sort of thing to go around because it's just how how do you do that basically because like obviously the idea of our entire project is to try and create a service where you can go and ask advice of people about the 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 DeFi space or or Web three in general. But so it's just quite, I'm just curious on different things people are implementing. Yeah. And so that's one of those things where if, uh, like I was part of one DAO where the governors of the DAO were, were chosen, you know, and voted upon. And so they were given a, a governance token um, versus the rewards token for, for participation, which was a separate token. Um but at the same time, 
um, you know, everyone started with a hundred votes, um, you know, a hundred tokens, but they could then, you know, either spread those out and give those out or delegate them to others. Um, as far as NFT, that just, that, that shows membership, you know, um, but it doesn't stop someone from, um, you know, accumulating more, um, per se, but it, it's, wouldn't you rather know one person has three votes than that person has three different wallets and doing three different vote, three votes for the same thing? Wouldn't you rather know that than, you know, the distributed vote from one person? Uh, could you elaborate on that? I don't get what you mean. So let's say one person went and created three wallets and they went and bought one membership NFT with each wallet. So um, one, because what, what will also happen is, is to be, so for our one, for example, you would, yes, you can buy them on the public market and stuff and it will, um, but then once it's brought, we then have to verify you onto the DAO itself. Yeah. So you don't automatically join. We have to sort of verify you own one and then add that wallet. Man- uh, well, not manually, but um, we w- it would it would flag up that someone's brought one, and then we have to say, well, who owned it before? Cool, that was so. Say like they sell it on secondary market. It will let us know who owned it before. We would remove that person and then add the new person, for example. So s- does that make sense? Ish. Yeah. And, and well, so one of the, well, one of the things that you do with that and what's done with that, is, you know, I don't know what you're um, like one of the like the platform that um, uh, Sam talks about, Samantha talks about is with um, Geneva. And I don't know if Geneva has this, but I know Discord has this, you know, token gating so that um, there it's it constantly checks your wallet to make sure you still qualify. And if you don't qualify, um, you know, expect, you know, then uh, it doesn't, then you're not allowed to see certain channels. And if you don't have the NFT, you automatically can't vote for something within like snapshot, Um, you know, and so that's one of those things to where, um, you know, that the free market side of things you're putting in a lot of man work for something that is already done, you know, especially if you're doing 10,000 because it's one of those things where um, that will bring, you know, open market for, for membership of things will bring more revenue to towards the DAO based off of, you know, the, your creator fee. And so you almost want an open market because, but what's really great about that is, once an you know one person has voted with an NFT, that NFT is sort of automatically checked off a list. This token has already voted, not holder per se, but this token has already voted, and now it's on for the next. You know now it, it's in lock until the uh, the vote is is tabulated and um, a decision is made before it's, you know, released to be able to be of value and do anything else. So Yeah, so that is how um, SuperDAO works, actually. You've explained it better than... I'm not very good at explaining things, but yeah, that explains it better than, than I did, but that's exactly how they work, essentially. So that token is locked, and what it also does is it's it doesn't matter how many NFTs you own within that one wallet either... Um, you still only get one vote within that same wallet. Yeah, and so what that then promotes is distributed distributed ownership. So one, would you rather know that one person has three votes in the same wallet and know that that person is holding three votes, or would you rather, or would you rather it someone has three different wallets, each one holding holding a vote, and because on the user side it's one of those things to where it's, it's quite easy to do on my side, but then for the DAO, you're like, Oh, I have three, I have three different people 
you know, what it looks like on chain is three different people voting for the same thing, you know? So you think that that might be more people swayed um, versus uh, or more people in favor of, whereas in, you know, you can see if one person has three votes, they have three NFTs within one wallet. You can say, oh, this person, one, one vote, one, one owner voted, uh, three of their votes for this. Yeah. So what, so, so basically another feature we can do with super DAO is basically set how many votes a particular NFT has. So for example, if they buy, so what I, I could probably set it up so that, um, the rarer ones of the NFTs have three votes, the, the, um, medium ones have two votes and then the, the least, the most unrare, um, will have one vote. We can set it up that way as well. So that, um, that's another way of doing it with super Dow. That, you know, that's, you know, uh, you know, you're think you're, you know, common, rare, epic, you know, trait type. Um, but then at the same time that, in my opinion, I don't think that that's fair for voting style because it's the luck of the draw then of, of who, who gets or the, not necessarily the luck of the draw, but the mint order. Um, and so if you're looking for one NFT, one vote, giving one NFT more weight over another can sort of make that, take that balance off because in, in, in one aspect, you could have two rare NFTs. So two people hold as much power as six people. No. So what we were going to do is we were just going to make every NFT the same price with the same vote is the way we were going to do it. So it would just be like, um, so we got 10 care of them because we want quite a few people to join because we're going to be a non-profit as well. So the second hand market is going to sort of be our way to have passive income coming in um along with tlds that we're going to work on later um and basically the the idea of the whole thing was to be sort of yeah every so basically it's going to be 50 usdc to buy and then it will just give you one vote and all of the nfts will be like 50 um us You you muted accidentally muted at the end of that, but I think you were saying fifty USD, you know, for one NFT basically, right? Yeah, so fifty USDC for one uh, NFT, and that one F NFT will give you one vote, and that will be across the entire lot. Basically, we will have traits. Don't get me wrong. So if they sell them on the secondary market, they can decide if it's rare or not. But um. But to start off with, everything will be the same price. Yeah. Well, the net. So the the, the only. I I in, in my opinion, your DAO, you know your DAO, you know um, your DAO should maybe vote on that. You know whether different NFTs have different weight for voting, but that then makes will make people feel that that will cause atrophy. And the atrophy is 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 a DAO's uh, biggest enemy, you know, lack of participation. Um, and so, you know, if if I have one NFT and the guy next to me has one NFT, but his NFT is worth two votes versus mine having one b based on rarity, then but we both paid the same price, you know, um, that then you know, would skew less effort because I'm like uh, less participation. Um, so yes, we, that, that would be my suggestion. So we did, we did have a vote on it and we basically, the vote decided that we should make it all the same price with one vote each. So yeah. that, that was the decision that was made. And then the other decision was, uh, was that we still give them the rarities so that when it comes to the secondary market, the the people that own the NFT can decide how um, 
how much they want that rarity to be to sell on secondary market. Yeah. And then, we, yeah. And then if, we're taking like a 10% fee for every sale. Yeah. If, if it doesn't hold, if it doesn't hold any, uh, weight in, um, the, um, in the voting process, then, uh, it should, you know, technically just be the same price all across the board. Um, if there's other perks that come with it, then, then yeah, then that might be something to do. But at the same time, you're then saying that one vote costs different than another vote, um, costs least or more, less or more. Um, but it depends on what they're getting out of it, I guess, besides the vote. Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing they're getting out of it is basically we're going to have a legal service that we're going to, allow people to sort of interact with as well. And the idea is that we, we, we sort of have them not on the books, but like as a, a, a somewhere we can send you to and by us getting you in touch with them and getting you started, we take a 10% fee right on top of whatever they're going to charge you. But then for depending on how many NFTs you own, sorry, a 5% fee, not a 10% fee, and then depending on how many NFTs you own, for every one NFT you own, 1% is taken off of that percentage of fee. Okay. So what you're, what you then see. Okay. I, mm. all right. I am, I'm spitballing here. You, you guys have been at the drawing board for a moment on this. So I'm just coming out of left field with that. What that would then, you know, do is see this is this is where what you're making you what you're doing is in a way sort of co- making it cost more for a person to do service through you. When if you're wanting participation, you would necess- you would technically want it to cost less to do participation through you. But the Dow, for the te- Dow Treasury to stay healthy, you would want it to um, to, to uh, sort of always stay the same. So not on top of, but off of. So let's say a service costs $1,000. It would still cost $1,000, but 900 of it would be going to the service provider or attorney, um, you know, and 10% would go to the Treasury. Now, um, I don't see why you would reduce um, if I'm getting a benefit and I'm paying less money, um, you know, to an attorney, um, you know, it, the it, in my opinion, the math would want would show that would say that the more NFTs I get technically, then the lower the price should be uh, overall. Not the not a lower price that the treasury gets because the treasury, the Dow, is providing the service through that contact. So that would be my that's my two cents on that. My two guay. So what we'd worked out is is actually that if if we've worked it out correctly, this is the passive income that we get from people selling the NFTs on the secondary market actually would earn us more than the percentage of actually sending them over to the lawyers. Well, yeah, but the, at the same time, you know, it, the way things get adopted is by being, um, you know, um, a better, cheaper, faster than the competitor. And so if you're, you already have a list of, service providers lined up one you're you're providing a a service faster um you know and if these people have already curated with you you know you're providing you know better um but now you're trying to you know um it's more expensive (laughs) more expensive um then it would almost drive people to not be a part of um and just do it naturally you know through you know an 
a, a, a search term search or find that person offline. But if instead I knew that, you know, the overall bill would be cheaper, that would be then the, 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 the reason for there to either be secondary market sales as well as uh, participation of use through your DAO. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep that in mind, actually. I might put that up on a vote because we haven't technically put the bit about making it cheaper with the ownership of the NFTs on our roadmap. That was just something I was spitballing. So I might put that up to a vote and see how that works out, actually. Yeah, because that makes more sense, to be fair. Um, but yeah, so we might might actually do that yeah thank you yeah no I, and i'm just i'm just one one random degen in space i i don't know sam do you, do you have any thoughts on that i have no clue i'm learning everything that's why i've been silent because this is a whole side i have no clue about any questions so, then no i'm just like writing things down and just like staying quiet so let me let me run through you basically what what we've what we've got and 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 i'll see if you guys so let me go to my website and read you what we actually did in the end and see and see what you guys think um da -da 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 -da. come on load you bugger <laughs> So basically the um in response to the growing demand of straight of, of stronger project protection in the decentralized finance DeFi area. The DeFi Alliance was established as a self-governing autonomous decentralized organization, DAO. The Alliance, the Alliance sorry, is aware of problems with creation, duplication, and hacks that, that domains, non-fungible tokens, and decentralized apps, DAPs incur. By placing a high priority on defending intellectual rights and putting policies in place to ensure that communities, the DeFi Alliance, seeks to address these problems in, uh, in general. The DeFi Alliance is a useful tool for a project wanting to navigate the intricate DeFi landscape and safety of their interests. The purpose of the DeFi Alliance in response to the growing demand of improved project protection in the in the decentralized finance sector, the DeFi Alliance was established as a Web3 technologies decentralized structure to make susceptible to abuse by imposters and scammers. These uh, these people have many chances to take advantage of projects in their creation because there isn't much regulation in this area. The DeFi Alliance seeks to offer a trustworthy source for defense and assistance of individuals in the, in the web free sector. The Alliance strives to protect projects and their creators from difficulties posed by the unregulated nature of web3 by operating as a self governed organized as, as a dao prioritizing the projects of intellectual rights and public policies in place to protect our communities are the key objectives of the alliance the alliance seeks to to seeks guidance and referral service legal aid and a platform for fundraising and revenue creation via nfts with aid of authorized legal counsel the dao the sorry the DeFi alliance is a valuable tool for projects wanting to navigate the thing so what we're going to do is we're going to have volunteers one of the main strategies implemented by DeFi Alliance is to provide volunteer staff who are knowledgeable on Web3 law in various jurisdictions and can offer advice on projects. This service is provided free of charge and is not handled by lawyers, but by individuals who have studied Web3 law. Legal services for projects that require more extensive legal assistance. The DeFi Alliance offers a referral service to connect them with lawyers who can help with any necessary 
legal action, this service comes with a 5% referral fee on top of the fees charged by the lawyer. Uh, the DeFi Alliance operates as a decentralized autonomous organization, DAO, through the SuperDAO platform, which allows the Alliance to raise funds and continue operation of the project and pay necessary personnel. Additionally, the Alliance will create non-fungible tokens that can be purchased to raise funds and generate revenue, with a proportion of the profits returning to the DAO. All funds raised by the DAO will be held on a Polygon wallet using a multi-sig setup required approval of multiple non-profit admin slash holders to access the funds. Um and then the reason why we're doing it. So the uh, decentralized finance DeFi infrastructure is expanding quickly. But this expansion also brings various risks and concerns. Because Web3 technology is decentralized, it is susceptible to abuse by imposters and scammers, which is increasing the need to improve protection of projects and their creators conflicts on the blockchain are caused by uh, of web3 domains the ease in which top level domains can be made that are identical to existing ones similarly the emergence of non-fungible tokens has been accompanied by problems of duplication in which clones of existing projects may show up triggering D disputes and possible violations that the creative rights applications uh, decentralized application dApps are open source which presents difficulties because bugs in the code and hackers ability to access and exploit the code by providing a self uh, organization that attempts to protect projects and their creators from difficulties brought by the nft space so that's basically the whole idea of the project. So, and that's, yeah, we're trying to do this. What, one suggestion on that. One, um, when you're saying scammers and imposters, I might suggest um, the one for just um, not clarity, but for... Um, grouping i guess you could say just say bad actors sorry i was um, talking to more complex was... and there's a reason why we we separated them and that was for legal reasons because under the law if you say bad actors that can mean anything from um people uh, committing crime as in like selling drugs or or people um, uh, like, um, I don't know, laundering money. We wanted to be more specific on a legal sort of standard. Understandable. Um, but if you're attempting to protect all of that, you know, or, or uh, aim to, it's it sort of, you know, when you're doing contract work or, or writing stuff out, but if you're explaining the service, you know, you can, um, you know, because then you could be talking about AML stuff as well, AML protections um, and, and all of that, um, where bad actors is, you know, just, you know, for all intents and purposes, uh, a, a wide range category. And I can understand in when it comes to cleaner paperwork that, you know, um, it just sort of one it, it sets a moral code i i would uh, you know I, I would assume but that's just my my like uh, very brief level there the, i feel that you know it, you work very hard to clearly define your mission which i'm 100 saying agree it's a great mission but um the, uh a tldr of it would 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 be beneficial but you know uh, some people might say like well what's the difference between a scammer and an imposter they're both trying to do something the same thing take my money uh, from me 
by ill-gotten means. And uh, to be fair to you, actually, what you just explained there makes complete sense. And and from a paperwork standard, I get what you mean. And then from the website standard. So what I'll do is I will change that tomorrow because actually that makes sense, to be fair. Um, and your advice is, is very much appreciated. Anytime. Uh, Sandra, I see your hand up. Yeah. Um, my question was, because I was reading along with you. I saw I was got up on your site and started reading with you. Um, the <laughs> volunteers, the people who are involved, are those people who maybe just have been educated within Web3 or they have projects themselves and they have the experience or people who also um, have some legal experiences from the past, anything like that? so no so what will so sort of yes and no so some of them will have projects they've done before some of them will have legal expertise and then others can be anybody in general because what we're going to do is we're also going to have like pdfs and videos and podcasts and and all this sort of stuff on the site that if a person comes to the live chat will be on the website the discord that we have or the um, telegram that we might be setting up and then we're going to have like um, uh, uh, Twitter spaces as well and with all of that basically they could go to the website they could type in the search box the subject that they're talking about and up will, up come, up will come all this information that they they can pull information from so what we so we will have some lawyers on staff and these lawyers will be the ones that will sort of help keep us up to date and regulated and then what will happen is is the the volunteers will just be the ones that will relay that information back to you so some may have that knowledge others may not but the information will be there for them to look up if necessary So one question I have, are, are are the volunteers going to be part of the DAO? If they want to be. So it, it, it isn't going to be an absolute necessary thing, but if they want to be, they can be, yes. Okay. So I've, I've been, I've, I've been part of a few DAOs where they've been, you know, I guess you could say advisement groups. Um, and so to be an advisor, you have to be a member of the DAO so that that way, you know, uh, you ha- the the DAO has always sort of been the is the feature of um, because one of the things that people forget with DAOs is that if you're going outside of the DAO for something, um you it has to be voted on so um if if you're providing um like so like i'm part of continuum 3000 um and it's a it's a it's a really amazing think tank um and pieces like that um and and not only so are there you know there there's it's founders legal um, and, and sort of, uh, along the same lines of, of, in a way of what you're doing, but it's, it's expanded beyond just, you know, you're providing a very, a good niche service, you know, but it's, it's network based. It's not a DAO. It's, it's a think tank in a way. Um, and so, but with a DAO, um, let's say um, uh, Tom, a founder, you know, to get services, you know, to be part of the organization that are part of the Alliance needs to be a member, you know, would want um, information from other Alliance members, you know, not from Alliance members, that then go out. And so it'd be one of those things like, you know, a network expansion project. So almost like a little, you're, you're a, a think tank in and of itself um, with a targeted focus. And so um, that's why a lot of think tanks don't go into a Dow, Dow structure, because if, 
I, you know, so if someone came, came to came and said, Hey, I need this service. It would then the, then the Dow would then have to like, you know, those that stood up, said hey i either provide that or i know someone that provides that um it would have to go to dow vote of who to choose um to get their information from and then who to choose like if i was like yes you know i know um mary jane great attorney you know the dow would then have to vote to allow me to go and get that um you know get that information and then the dow would have to vote on that information being good enough to pass on um where i think maybe rather than you know the dow might be membership to to this network um and not necessarily be um not necessarily be, especially if you're going to, you know, you're, you're thinking of using volunteers, you know, why would, you know, if, uh, I would use volunteers within the community, if that makes sense, within the DAO, not going outside of it, because then you have staff and then you have to, you know, vote on, you know, on providing wages for the staff outside of the DAO type of thing. So... This is where a bit of confusion comes in when talking to so people outside of America, because we've got something in England called a citizens, citizens Advice Service, which is what we're trying to bring to a wider market in Web3. And a Citizens Advice Service is basically um, people that... So they have volunteers on staff, just like what we're doing. And what they do is they're, they're just there for you to go and go to the, um not the local council but you go to like a it, it, it's in a council building so you go to the you go to the service and you can ask legal advice on different things that are happening to you within like the workplace or within a business that you run or within um different things that happen in in britain basically and you can just get legal advice and there and they're just volunteers that don't get paid for doing it. They just have the knowledge or have been given the the training and information needed for people to be able to go and do this. So we're trying to do the same thing, essentially. Um, it might help if I actually do a tweet and pin it up there. It might help a bit more in a second. But um, I'll let Sam ask his question and then I'll um, start writing that out so it helps you out. Um. Um, I love hearing all this. I got to let you know, my uh, background is adolescent family counseling and I have a master's in nonprofit and living in South Florida, there is a, it's not an alliance per se, but there is an organization that is senior citizens that are volunteers that you are able to go and get different suggestions, different advice, different support for different areas. Some are law, some are accounting, um, and, you know, some are just for housing, different things like that. So, I mean, there's, I understand what you're talking about. If that's what you're talking about, that kind of thing. That's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what, that's what the citizens advice service is in England. And I thought it, that idea worked for something like this to, to protect the web three slash DeFi space. Well, my question is, is how do you keep them involved? Um, going back to something that Taco said, when it comes to having them have an NFT, are they part of the DAO? Um, because you want them to have be, have some kind of investment for them to stay engaged. And that's a little thought with all the conversation that I've been listening to. So the, the so basically there's 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 two ways we there's two ways we can go about it. One, people can just volunteer their time because they want to volunteer their time. A bit like if you go to like a charity shop and all that sort of thing, as an example, right? So they just volunteer their time because they want to do it. Others, if they want to get involved and own one of the NFTs, they can do. But if they're... One of the other things 
we were trying to discuss was that if they're a volunteer and own one of the NFTs, they could potentially eventually either end up as a actual, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, like, um, we could pay them for their time a little bit or they have the right to like vote or do their own thing and all that sort of jazz or I don't know really like the I don't know what the I think the incentive would would mainly be like a normal volunteering thing like the incentive being that you want to do it because you want to do it if that makes sense it really does but I also understand the way the world is moving forward in business and working out and in volunteership. Um, there is going to have to be some kind of account accountability moving forward. Um, being somebody who lives in South Florida, I call it the buckle of senior citizen bill. And just in South Florida, from Jupiter down to Hollywood, we have, I think it's like thirty to 40,000 volunteers. Now, some are very invested, some are not. And when I look at how we are structuring DAOs and structuring people to be able to help each other out and give sources and resources and value, I think you have to have some kind of accountability there. And that's just what I'm looking at. It, I, and I've, I've been part of... Um not necessarily uh, a citizens alliance, but um, ad hoc committees, you know, put on by through cities for specific targets. So I've seen those in action. Um, I've been a CASA. Um, and um, one of the biggest pieces with that, you know, is um, so like in special needs and stuff like that, you know, they want, I, I guess you would call them, public boards where it's a diverse group bless you bless you um it's a diverse group you know of you know uh, what they call stakeholders um those are